Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Mission Control, a podcast focusing on executive directors and nonprofit professionals and leaders and how they strive to make positive impacts in their community. I'm your host, Paul Schmidt, owner and creative video strategist for Introduce Multimedia. And I'd like to welcome my next guest this week. I'm excited. Is Brian Fulson, the, the leader, the head honcho of Highfields, Inc. Brian, welcome to, the, welcome to the program. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks, Paul. It's great to be here. <laughs> and so, as I mentioned uh, prior to the show beginning, Brian, uh, the show is called Mission Control. So tell me a little bit about what is the mission of Highfields? Yeah, you know, Highfields was founded in 1962, and ultimately our mission is to provide opportunities to children, youth, and families, and to help them become more responsible for their own lives and to strengthen their relationships with others. You know, in essence, to you know, help them become productive in, in whatever manner that might be. Now, I'm fairly, I've known about Highfields for a while, and uh, I'm, we're, my company is fairly new in, in uh, working with you guys, but what, what's the background to the name? What, is the, what does Highfields mean? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a great question. You know, I, uh, uh, originally, we were uh, a, a camp for boys in in the early 60s. And originally, I think we were called Camp Ingham, you know, because it was in Ingham County. And uh, and the, the vision was to create a place where, you know, adjudicated youth didn't have to leave the county to go get the residential treatment help that they needed. And, uh, and it was modeled after... Uh, Camp Oakland at that time was a place very similar in Oakland County or uh, a Wayne County program. And so they created this, called it Camp Ingham. One of our, our key founders, Judge Robert Drake, uh, they wanted to name it Camp Drake. And he really said, you know, absolutely not. I don't want it named after me. And um and so as they were walking through, you know, this 140 acres here in rural Onondaga, I, as the story goes, one of them looked and said, man, those fields look kind of high. And so they named it High Field. So there's really no deep hidden meaning between High Fields other than uh, uh, they, didn't, they wanted to change it from camping. Um, <laughs> so, so no glorious heroic story behind the the whole name that's awesome no, no. yeah <laughs> but but speaking of uh high fields and and the work that you do um and what really brought you to high fields is the fact that you have a very storied history speaking of history with juvenile justice and i don't know if that's the the more if that's the modern day or proper term for what I'm talking about, um, about what you guys do, but what what got you into this work? Because it seems like, you know, going back through uh, your your history, it seems like that this is like you are that this makes who you are. Yeah. So you know, it's uh, so for high fields, uh, we really were working with in the early days, you know, delinquent adjudicated youth that had, had gotten in trouble with uh, the law, but also, you know, abuse and neglected youth. And uh, over the years that that mission has uh, really changed. And uh, so we really, our focus today is to help any children and adolescent uh, wherever their need is. And so they don't ever have to have an out of home placement and, uh, you know, and, and and while our goal is uh, to keep the kids in the home whenever possible and to safely do so and keep them in the community, there still is an occasional need for youth to receive a short-term residential program. And that that's why our residential program continues to this day, much different than what it was in the 60s and 70s. And, uh, and the type of youth that we get today are significantly different. But our, our residential program, while it's still here, it's one of our smallest programs in terms of individuals that we serve. And, you know, our other community-based programs really bear the bulk of uh, the number of clients we see and 
the amount of work and staff that that we have. In you know, uh, in your in your history with this work, I mean, you started. It seems right out of college doing this. What what drew you to this work? Yeah, you know, Paul, that's a great question. And uh, you know, I went to you know Spring Harbor College, now Spring Harbor University, and uh, I really went uh, and I was really undecided. Do I want to? I want to work with. What youth or want to work with, you know, uh, and or I was considering, you know, what uh, a ministry major, I'm going to be a youth minister. And in my sophomore year, and this coming April, be 40 years ago, my sophomore year, I did uh, a small uh, internship at the county juvenile home in Jackson. And uh, and it, it changed my life. I, I went home and I said back to my dorm. I said, these are the exact kind of kids I want to work with. And and I said, I can I can always do ministry with these kinds of kids. I can't always uh you know uh, do social work in, in youth ministry. And so, you know, that that actually that was um, uh, you know, 42 years ago when I had that internship. And this coming April will be my 40th year in the business. And uh and today I work with all systems, child welfare. You know what? Uh, you know behavioral health, mental health, education systems, and and my practice is much more at a macro level in terms of not seeing individual, you know, st students and families. But uh, uh, you know, I I I wanted to make a difference at at the the biggest level possible, and that's that's really why I got into the work. And so, when you let's say you, you know, like you said, you are one of those rare humans that figured out their path early. Mm -hmm. um, and when you, I say that because I'm also one of those rare humans that <laughs> figured out, oh, this is what's for me. And I just stuck with it. And I, that's, that's who I am for the past 20, 30 years. And so, um, but, but when you, when you stepped into this world, um, what were, you know, what was it like when the honeymoon period was over? Because you stayed with this youth center for like a couple decades. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I, I often tell students or individuals that regardless of what career path you choose, eventually you're going to have what I call the baptism by fire, where uh, the honeymoon's over and, you know, the proverbial fertilizer hits the oscillator and your world blows up and, and, and some people go home and they say, I can't do this anymore. They go back to work the next day. They turn their keys in, they write their resignation letter and they, they go look for something else. I still remember when I had my baptism by fire and, uh, you know, I was in my early twenties and, and I went home and I woke up at 2 a.m. And I said, this is what I want to do. These are the kids I want to work with. They can call me names. They can curse me out. They can they can throw stuff at me. They can take a swing at me. But these are the kids that need the help. And that's that's really where I was. Now, that's not for everybody. Uh, you know, I and, and I, I remember you know, with my, my kids and my family, you know, we're sitting at dinner one night and my youngest who was a kindergartner says, dad, the bus driver pulled the bus over and she started to cry. I said, why? She said, because the kindergartners wouldn't all stay in their seat. So it doesn't matter what job you have. You're going to have a baptism by fire. Your world's going to fall apart, but you need to find a way to, to be resilient, find something that you like, it's a passion for you and get out there and go do it. Well, absolutely. What do you feel comfortable in talking about what your baptism by fire was? Yeah. So, uh, uh, I, I won't use the first name, but, uh, I, I remember I had a kid at the juvenile home in Jackson who was playing his radio way too loud. And, uh, uh, and so, you know, the staff says, OK, you're a new staff. You need to go down the hall, open the door and you need to tell this the student you need to turn the radio down. And if they fail to turn this little transistor radio down, they're going to lose their radio. So I go warn them. 
basically the student says, you know, curses me out and uh, I give him five more minutes. I go down, I take the radio. Uh, I'm, I'm backing out of this detention cell. I think the kids are going to swing at me, et cetera. And uh, I shut the door, I lock it. And this young man goes off and, and he bangs and pounds for, you know, 40 minutes. And, uh, and now we're going to go have to remove him from his room because he's been very disruptive and we're going to have to take him to a secure area of the building. So now we're going to have to do physical management. We get down there and he's pounded so hard. He's jammed the deadbolt and we can't unlock it. We have to call a locksmith. Uh, and it it was not until the next morning that that young man was able to get out of his room. There was a you know a toilet and sink in there, so he was he was okay. But that next day, the entire shift, he looked at me and 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 he he would just mutter and mutter and mutter and uh, and he was he just kept saying I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna come kick your butt and you know it was much more colorful language, and I remember, you know, waking up at two a.m. fearful I was gonna have to go face that that young man at three o'clock the next day. And, uh, and, and I went back, you know, and my heart is like right here. And I'm thinking, man, he's, you know, he was a big kid too. And, uh, you know, and I, I was just, I didn't even think I was off of probation. And, uh, so we, we had to have a conversation, you know, we kind of debriefed it and, uh, and, and it all ended well. Uh, but I, I remember waking up, like I said, at 2 a.m. saying, man, I, I don't know if I can go back to work. I don't, I mean, can I, you know, so, and there's, you know, everybody has a similar kind of story. And, um, but I know that children and adolescents, uh, particularly delinquent youth, you know, we, we say hurt people, hurt people. They've, they've had a lot of things that have happened to them, the trauma that comes to their life and that they've experienced and seen, and and they just need an opportunity to work through that. They need someone to be patient and to, you know, help them overcome whatever issues they have experienced and and ultimately be better on the back end of that entire experience and treatment. So from all that, you were able to rise to the ranks of of that of that place. And uh you talk a little bit about um what kind of uh, changes that you were able to oversee that you thought worked well and maybe some that didn't work well? Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's interesting. You know, the state of Michigan is in the midst of and some final stages of some juvenile justice reform, as well as, you know, child welfare and, and behavioral health reform. Uh, you know, in, in my fourth decade, there's there's been a significant amount of changes that have occurred in Michigan. And uh and you know, we know things now that we didn't know then, uh, you know, when I first started. And so uh just you know, I ultimately have I've been very, very happy and proud, if you will, that uh a willingness to be creative and adaptive as as we learn more and constant learning uh, about the children and youth we work with because you know there's there's new technology there's new trends there's new theories there's new research and and you just cannot keep doing the things that we've always been doing and you know and 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 the children and families we work with quite honestly are are dependent upon us to be constant learners and to be constantly evaluating what works and what's effective. And, uh, you know, the other thing is, is that, uh, you know, uh, finding a way to make all the people that I've come in contact with uh, to, you know, to work well together, to be a good team, to be an effective team and, uh, you know, to have a common shared vision, you uh, Really, it doesn't matter what program, it doesn't matter what theory, it doesn't matter what research. If people cannot work together for a common cause in, in any program or any agency, then 
and you're probably not going to be successful. Right on, right on. So in essence, um, um, when you, when you uh, went into, or excuse me, when you were thinking about, let me back up a little bit. Did you expect, because, you know, you said that you've seen a lot of folks, uh, like, not quite make it across the finish line with the with their career there. But you were at, at this youth center for two decades. Did you expect to be there that long? Or yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, that's that's a great question. You know what? Uh, no, I, I didn't. You know, I mean, I in you know, uh, you know, I'm starting my 19th year next week at Highfields. Mm -hmm. And uh and then you add that, you know, the uh you know the 20 plus years that you know I did at uh you know the youth center and you know most people work what seven eight jobs in their life I basically was at two places and uh you know I I don't know what my expectation was when I hired into youth center other than to learn and and try to become better and you know uh you know I was a social worker and I wanted to to be good at what I did and to learn as much as I could and uh and then the time just flew, you know, I, I had great opportunities, I had great people that I worked with and great teachers, uh, you know, and then I, you know, had an opportunity to, you know, take a leadership role and, you know, and I've, you know, the Lord's blessed me. I've been in lots of great places and opportunities, uh, you know, to help make good things happen. And, uh, you know, so I, I mean, you know, most people don't know this, but Every five years when I was an exec, I wrote a resignation letter. Like mm -hmm. I was done. I mean, I two times, actually, if Judge Vandercook sees this, she would not know that uh, every five years when I was there for 15 years. So three resignation letters and the and and then I would sit on it and then I would get basically a new five year vision for what the youth center was going to do. And then I would tear that resignation letter up. The third time I wrote it, uh, I was like, yeah, I, I think maybe it's time. And then then I looked around and uh, found the Highfields opportunity. And, uh, uh, you know, and I've, I've I haven't written any resignation letters here. I just keep growing the vision a little bit. Well, that's that's really interesting. Uh, three three resignation letter. What what do you feel like was the biggest reason why you did that? Why did you, was it kind of like to jumpstart yourself or was it just like, you know, this gives me an out? Uh, you know, I, I think it was, you know, I, I, each, each of those five years, I kind of set out to do certain things, you know, to take the youth center to a new place, a new program. And, and I, I really wanted to make sure that I was still the person for the job. I wanted to make sure, and you know, this is pretty personal, but you know, was, was, you know, my faith was God, still calling me to be there was there somewhere else i needed to be so i would go through this period of kind of introspection and evaluation and uh and then you know uh in the first two experiences it was an absolute affirmation that uh this is where i needed to be and so i stayed and you know the third time through i, I just i didn't feel like i had that affirmation that that maybe there was you know, other opportunities. And, uh, and I, I was, uh, I mean, you know, I was a big fish in kind of a small pond. And then, you know, when I came to Highfields, I mean, I, you know, there's, I, th those early days work was hard and, uh, and there was endless possibilities and, uh, you know, and, and, and it still is, I think, you know, I often say I want to work myself, work our agency out of a job, uh, you know, I, the reality is it's probably not going to happen, but would that not be great if we did, did not need a place to serve adjudicated youth or children in the mental health or child welfare systems? Well, that, that, that brings us to now, like you said, you moved on to your second location, technically, mm -hmm. um, learning what you learned from those first 15, um, 20 years. And so, 
and you didn't write a resignation letter this time around. So what, no, I haven't. what, what's the difference there? I mean, did you already figure out your leadership qualities to move forward or what, wh why not? Yeah. You know, yeah, that's, that's a good question. You know, I, uh, I definitely, so I, I would say when I arrived at Highfields, I, I was pretty confident, maybe even a little cocky in my leadership ability, <laughs> but, uh, that, that was quickly, you know, set aside because I, I have more than anything, I have learned that I just absolutely need to continue to be a lifelong learner. I, I, I tell people all the time, I'm coachable. Just, just help me talk about what you want me to talk about, you know, help, help me help you become as good as you can be. But uh, yeah, there's, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm still reading, you know, I, I just, you know, finished uh, uh, Tony Dungy's book, you know, Quiet Strength. And, uh, you know, it's an oldie. I'd read it uh, before, uh, you know, I'm, I'm re reading John Maxwell's book right now, uh, the 21 minutes, the most important 21 minutes of uh, in a leader's day. And uh, and there's, there's some great lessons in those kinds of books. And, you know, continuing to make yourself... Uh, as, as good as you can be. Now, you've, you've been at Highfields for a while. How did that leadership and that semi-cockiness help when the pandemic hit? How did you guys handle that? Yeah, you know, that's, boy, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I'm not even sure if, if, if I coined it or I pulled it you know, from a bunch of different staff, but, but I, it, my tagline became same mission, different strategies. Okay. Our, our mission in no way has changed. We're still helping children and families, but we need to find different ways to do that. And if that's telehealth and, you know, if that's uh, dropping, you know, stuff. So we had, you know, these after school programs and, uh, you know, kids weren't in school now. We couldn't do after school in person, but, our staff would create these after school, you know, bundles like uh, and we would drop them off at kids doors. So they would have all these activities to do and homework and ways to keep them engaged. And then and then we just kept doing that. And our donors came to support us. So it was same mission, helping kids in elementary and middle school learn and different strategies. So. How how is that carrying at post pandemic? How are you how are you really uh, uh, making sure that you know that pivot as that was the the term of the century there? How did that carry forward? Yeah, and you know, so the workforce challenge has been you know uh, I think so many people have become pretty comfortable in this work from home remote flexible schedule, use of technology, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, may, maybe it's because I'm still a little maybe old school, but children and families still need in-person uh, people to to come into their lives and, and care for them and help them. And, and, and much of our work, the Highfields model has been seeing children and families in their home. And, uh, and that was a challenge during the pandemic because everything we knew about the pandemic says don't go into other people's homes, stay six feet away, you know. And so trying to find people that uh, are still very passionate and, and willing to engage a world that needs them is, is pretty critical. And uh, so, you know, kind of resetting the needle a little bit about what what is needed by our children and families and what we can do as an agency to help meet that need. Uh, so we're just continuing to evolve the strategies. Maybe it doesn't look a hundred percent like it did pre pandemic, but, but it does need to look different than what it was in the midst of the pandemic. And uh, I'm pretty proud. I think uh, the vast majority of our staff are, are answering that call and uh, and they all sense that children and families still need help and they're they're willing to give them that. So how would you describe uh, in a phrase your 40 plus years in the role that you've been in? 
how, how would you look back and just kind of say, how would you describe that evolution? Yeah, you know, uh, you know, so a couple answers. So my my personal values are are faith, family, friends in that order. Uh, in my work in the early days was specifically with children and adolescents, and then it went and it and it evolved to children and adolescents, and then added the families and. Much of my work today is a much macro level where it's helping organizations help children and families so then they can help the children. It's much bigger today. And I often say, as a CEO, my job is to make sure everybody plays well in the sandbox. It's less today about my specific content knowledge of a of a particular theory, of a particular style or treatment methodology. It's allowing the staff that work those programs to put them in the best position to do their job. And uh, and sometimes, you know, the reality is sometimes adults in the business don't always cooperate and communicate like they should to help the children and families they serve with. And that that's part of my job is to be a communicator, uh, uh, mediator, and a bridge between those entities. So what do you do to escape? What do you do outside the offices to just kind of like decompress or just kind of get away for a little bit? I mean, you love what you do. You've been doing the same thing for 40 plus years, right. but you have other interests and you have other, other ways to, to use your time. What, what, what are those ways? Yeah. So I'm a, uh, you know, a uh, kind of a, you know, a, a, I don't know if I'd say a fitness geek, but uh, <laughs> but I, I'm I'm pretty faithful about uh, taking good care of myself. It didn't have to be. That. I wasn't that way. You know, 10, 10 years ago, I I honestly, in true self-confession here, 10 years ago, I weighed 110 pounds heavier than what I do now. Over three years, I lost 100 pounds. I'm, I'm very focused on, on what I eat and, and how I take care of myself. You know, I... I walk, I go to the gym. Uh, you know, I, I have a core group of, uh, you know, men and brothers that I meet with on a personal level. And we were supportive of each other. My family's amazing. My kids, my grandkids, they are my, my pride and joy. And, uh, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell, you know, it's about balance and life and, you know, all different aspects of wellness really impact each of the other areas. And, you know, you got to spend time focusing on all those different areas. That's incredible. And so do you feel like that, um, that wellness aspect that you've taken to yourself personally kind of trickles down into the staff to even to the residents that you, that you work with? Do you think, yeah, that, I, you know, inadvertently so. maybe? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I mean, they, you know, they all see me carrying my water ball around. So when I, you know, I started this kick drinking a gallon of water a day and uh, they laughed at me because I really was using, uh, you know, a, a, a lemonade two liter bottle. And they said, buy a real water bottle. Come on. You're like embarrassing us. So, you know, so I, I, I had to go out and get a real water bottle, you know, the, you know, they're like, we can't have our CEO drinking out of a plastic jug you know so uh so yeah i think so uh i believe that they uh they they very clearly know kind of my story and uh and lots of staff want to have little sidebar conversations about hey how did you do it and any tips for me that you know could be helpful that's great how how is the best way, what is the best way for people to get a hold of you if they see this conversation and they want to know a little bit more about you, your organization? What's the best way? Yeah, you know, just drop me an email, you know, uh, uh, our website, you know, has my email. It's bfilson at highfields.org. But, uh, you know, they, they could clearly call any of the Highfields offices and they'll just transfer you to my cell phone. But uh, people, people would, you know, I, I'm, I think I'm, I'm, uh, I'm out there in the in the, the Google world pretty clearly, so people could find me if they wanted me. That's awesome. Well, it was really truly an honor to hear this story. It was such a 
uh, you know, researching you a little bit, just understanding the fact that I'm like, man, he has been in this forever. So thank you very much for yeah. being on the, the program and being on the show. Really appreciate it, Brian. Yeah, really thank much. you, Paul. I do appreciate it. Absolutely. Take care. Have yeah. a great day. You too. And thank you, everybody, again, for taking some time to listen to this program. And don't miss the next episode that's coming out in a couple of weeks. And if there's someone that you know of that you would like to hear about their journey, please email us at missioncontrol at unodeuce.com. And if this is your first time here, please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcasting platform and give us a review. Thank you again. And we'll see you next time in the control room, in the control center. Have a good one, everybody.